Greetings, and welcome to the December offering of Radio Plays, presented to you by Willits Community Theatre and Radio KLLG. Tonight, to get you in the spirit of the holidays, we bring you a new adaptation of Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. So, for the next hour, please get comfortable and enjoy with us this story of spiritual redemption and the greatest ghost story for Christmas ever written. Ladies and gentlemen, A Christmas Carol. Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. That Marley was dead must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting-house, a grim, cheerless place, if ever there was one. Scrooge never painted out Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the door, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. <laughs> it was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and he spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. He carried his own low temperature always about him. He iced his offices in the dog days, and did not thaw it one degree in winter. External heat and cold had very little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, nor wintry weather chill him. Nobody ever stopped him on the street to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars asked him to bestow a trifle, or a child asked him what it was a clock. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. Once upon a time, of all the good days of the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting-house. It was cold, bleak, and biting weather, and foggy withal. The door to Scrooge's counting-house was open, that he might keep an eye on his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, worked on the ledgers. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like just one coal. But Scrooge kept the coal-box locked in his room, and surely as the clerk came in with a shovel, the master predicted that he would have to look for other employment. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas, Bob. It was Scrooge's nephew. Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred. God save you, Uncle. Uh, bah! <laughs> humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle. Now I'm sure you don't mean that. I do. <laughs> Merry Christmas. What right have you to marry? What reason have you? You're poor enough? Come, then. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. <laughs> Humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? What's Christmas but a time to you for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who went about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew, 
Keep Christmas in your way, and, and I'll keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, Uncle. Well, th let me leave it alone, then. And much good may it do you. <laughs> much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I derive good, but which I have not profited materially, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, pleasant, and charitable time. And therefore, Uncle, though it never put a scrap of gold in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Oh, well said, sir. <laughs> Let me hear another sound out of you, Bob Cratchit, and you'll be keeping your Christmas by losing your situation. As for you, nephew, <laughs> you're, you're quite a powerful speaker. <laughs> I wonder you shouldn't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come dine with us tomorrow. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing else of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry you feel so resolute, Uncle. But I will keep my Christmas humor to the last. Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. <laughs> bah! <clears throat> Humbug! And a Merry Christmas to you, Bob, your missus, and all of your family. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fred. Uh, the same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. <clears throat> Nonsense. My clerk with 15 shillings a week, a, a wife, a family, talking about Merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. There's someone at the door. Go see who it is. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is this the firm of Scrooge and Marley? Yes, it is, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. This way, sir. What is it? A gentleman to see you, sir. Uh, show him in. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. <laughs> I trust the generosity of his firm is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive time of the year... It is only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some food and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but there are many thousands who are now in want of common necessities and hundreds of thousands are in want of the simplest comforts. Are there no prisons? There are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses? They're still in operation, I trust? I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor laws are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. I'm glad to hear that. I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their operations. These institutions scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind and body to the multitude. So a few of us are endeavoring to raise funds... For the poor, because it's at this time that want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. <laughs> a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to provide some additional provision for the poor and destitute. Um, sir, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, so you wish to remain anonymous then? I wish to be left alone. I do not make myself marry it. Christmas time, I can't afford to make a lot of other idle people marry. I support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there, sir. And there are many who could but would rather die. Well, then let them do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I only have your word that all this is so. But it is the truth, Mr. Scrooge. Well, then... So be it. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not interfere with the business of others. Mine occupies me constantly. Good day, sir. Very well, Mr. Scrooge. Good afternoon. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Yes, sir. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so 
that people ran about with flaming torches, offering their services to go before horses and carriages to conduct their way, foggier yet and colder still, piercing, searching, biting cold. The owner of one scant young nose stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of, God rest you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler on his desk with such energy that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and the more congenial frost. At length, the hour for shutting up the counting house had arrived. Cratchit. Yes, Mr. Scrooge. I suppose you'll want the whole day off tomorrow? Uh, If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop you half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir, And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year, sir. (laughs) Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. Oh, I will, sir. Merry Christmas, sir. (laughs) Bah. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and, having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, headed home for bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of a building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could fancy that it must have run there as a young house when playing hide-and-seek with the other houses and forgotten its way out again. It was old now and dreary, and nobody lived there but Scrooge all the other rooms being let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew every stone, was forced to grope along with his hands. Now, the fact that there was nothing in particular about the door-knocker, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it every night and morning during his whole residence here. Also, that Scrooge had as little as what is called fancy about him as any man in London. And further, Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since he mentioned his seven years' dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker Not a knocker, but Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue. He put his hand back upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, lighted his candle, and then closed the door with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door walked across the hall and up the stairs, trimming his candle as he went. Scrooge walked through his rooms to see that all was right. All was as it should be. Then he closed the door. He locked himself in. He double-locked himself in, which was not his custom, and took off his cravat and put on his dressing gown and slippers, then his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. As Scrooge threw back his head in his chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell 
that hung in his room, long disconnected and forgotten. It was astonishing to Scrooge that as he looked at the bell, it began to sway and ring, and shortly after it started, did every bell in the house. Someone's in the cellar, but, but the door is locked and double locked. Something's coming. Some, something is coming closer. It's outside my door. Ah, I won't believe it. It's still humbug. Scrooge's color changed when the apparition passed through the heavy door and into his room. Ebenezer! Ebenezer Scrooge! Molly's ghost? What, what do you want with me? I want much of you, Ebenezer. <laughs> who, who, who are you? Best to ask me who I was. Very particular for a ghost. Who, who were you, then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. J- Jacob Marley? But, but you're dead. He, you died seven years ago. Seven years is very nice. What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I do not. You doubt your senses, Ebenezer? Yes, because little things affect them. A, a slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef or a, a blot of mustard, a cr- crumb of cheese or a... A fragment of underdone potato. (laughs) There's more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Bah, humbug, I tell you. (laughs) Oh, man of worldly mind. Do you believe in me or not? Uh, I I do. I I do believe in you, but why do you walk the earth and why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad with his fellow man. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander the world. But but tell me, why, why are you bound so? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard of my own free will. Is this pattern strange to you? Keys, uh, cash boxes, ledgers, locks in purses. Would you like to know the weight and length of the chain you bear? It was as full and heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain now. Uh, Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. It must come from others. I cannot rest. I cannot linger. Weary journeys lie before me. You you travel fast? Yes, Ebenezer, on the wings of the wind. Uh, Seven years dead and and traveling all this time. (laughs) You must have covered great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, seven years, Ebenezer. No space of regret could make amends for one life's opportunities missed. But but you were always a a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, and the common welfare. They were all my business. And at this time of year, I suffer most. Oh! oh. (laughs) But Jacob... Hear me. My time is nearly gone. I I will, but... Don't be hard on me, Jacob. I am here to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. You you were always a a good friend to me, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned? It is. 
then I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to escape the path that I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Oh, couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night after the last stroke of twelve has ended. Look to see me no more. And remember what has passed between us all. Scrooge followed Marley as he backed up and floated out the window. Scrooge looked out and saw the air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in relentless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them was bound in chains like Marley's ghost. The misery with them all was clear. They sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. Scrooge closed the window and being from the emotion he had undergone or the fatigues of the day or the lateness of the hour much in need of repose, he went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the instant. Scrooge awoke. He was lying in his bed fully dressed. Suddenly, light flashed up in the room and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not a child. Its hair hung down its back and was white as if with age, yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. It wore a tunic of purest white and held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand. But the strangest thing about it was that from its head sprung a bright jet of clear light, by which all was visible. And it carried a great conical extinguisher cap, much like a giant candle snuffer, under its arm. Ebenezer Scrooge, I have come for you. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold me? I am. Who, what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past, Ebenezer. Why do you not wear your cap? What? Would you so soon put out the light I give? What, what do you want with me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare. A night of unbroken rest would be more conducive to that. Your... Reclamation, then. Take heed. Rise and walk with me. Oh, no. Not, not out the window. I'm not a spirit. I, I am mortal. I, I will fall. Bear but the touch of my hand on your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Uh, where are we? What's become of the city? And, and there's snow on the ground. Where are we? These are the th shadows of the things that have been. Do you recognize this countryside? Oh, oh, I, I know every inch of it. I, I was a boy here. I know every rock and tree. And the bleak building over there? Ah, that building, yes. I, I was educated there. I went to school in that horrible place. Do you recognize this path? I recognize it. I could walk it blindfold. Strange, you should have forgotten it for so many years. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. What do you see? I, I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his family, alone. Yes, yes, I, I know that boy. It, it was a lonely time. That poor boy. What's the matter, Scrooge? Uh, nothing, nothing. Well, a, a waif came to my door singing Christmas carols last night. A, a pale, 
thin little lad in a ragged coat. I, I should like to have given him something. Is, is that so? Come, let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger, and the room became a little darker and much more dilapidated. How this was brought about, Scrooge knew not, but knew that it was quite correct. So there he was alone again when all the other boys had gone home for the holidays. He was not reading now, but pacing despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, who, with a mournful shaking of its head, glanced anxiously toward the door. It opened, and a girl came darting in. She was much younger than the boy and embraced him enthusiastically. Brother, dear brother, I've come to bring you home. Home, home, home. Home, little fan? Yes, home for good and all. Father's so much kinder than he used to be. Home is like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, yes, you should. And he sent me in a coach to bring you, and you're to be a man and never come back here. But first, we're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest Christmas in all the world. Always a delicate creature, whom even a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. You're right. I'll not gainsay against it. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. Um, One child. True. Your nephew, Fred. Now, let's see another Christmas. Do you know this place, Ebenezer Scrooge? (laughs) I know it. This is the business where I was apprenticed. My old master, oh, bless his heart, old Fezziwig, old Fezziwig alive again, oh, and hosting one of his famous Christmas parties. Oh, and there's Dick Wilkins. He was very much attached to me. Poor dear Dick. Oh, and, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig with, with a radiant smile and her three fine daughters. Oh, and, and the table's all loaded with roasts and Cider and minced pies and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man with the light heart and the kind smile. Do you recognize him? Yes, yes. Yes, how happy I was then. A small matter for old Fezziwig to make these silly folks around him so full of joy. Small matter? A small matter indeed. Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves such praise? It's not that, Spirit. Old Fezziwig, he he had the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or heavy. His power was in his words, in in looks, and the things so small they couldn't be counted up. The happiness he gave us was as great as if it cost a, a... What's the matter? Oh, oh, nothing. Nothing at all, spirit. Something, I think. Speak. Oh, well, only that it's just I wish I should be able to say a word or two to my clerk, uh, Bob Cratchit, that's all. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. This is our last visit to your past, Ebenezer. Here with that fair young girl by your side. Do you recognize yourself, Ebenezer? No. (laughs) No, no. Spirit, spare me this. You are older now. A man in the prime of your life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes have become the eager, greedy, restless eyes of a miser. No. No, please. She knows it, too. That girl by your side, with the tears in her eyes. It matters little. To you, very little, I know that. Another idol has displaced me. What? What idol has displaced you? A golden one. Belle, have I changed toward you? Our contract is an old one. When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better, then, to to be poor? Better at least to be happy. You are changed. 
You were another man then. I was a boy. You blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words? No, never. In, in what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in everything that made my love of any value in your sight. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? You, you think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could. So I release you from your promise, with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Oh. Bell! Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me, a very brief pain, but soon it will dim, like a half-remembered dream, an unprofitable dream, and you will be glad to wake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you've chosen, Ebenezer. Spirit, Spirit, I can't take any more. Leave me, Leave. haunt me no more. Take me back, take me back. Suddenly, they were once again in Scrooge's chambers. Scrooge observed that the light from the spirit was burning brightly, and dimly connected that with its influence over him. He seized the extinguisher cap in a sudden action, pressed it down upon the spirit's head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted, and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, barely had enough time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. On the stroke of one, Scrooge awakened suddenly and sat bolt upright in his own bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from what direction the second specter might appear. At that moment, nothing would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. And consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes... A quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. Then, as he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light, which seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and the ceiling were hung so with living green that it looked like a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time or even long before. Heaped up upon the floor to form a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state, upon this couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in his hand, much like Plenty's horn, and held up high to shed light on Scrooge as he came peeping around the door. Come in, come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You've never seen the likes of me before. Never. Have you never walked forth with other members of my family? I'm afraid I have not. Have you many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. Last time I went by compulsion and 
I learned my lesson. That tonight if you would teach me, let, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Where, where have you brought me, spirit? A humble dwelling on a humble street. It is humble enough. Yet there is happiness here. Who, who are these people? Who, who is that woman and these children? These are the family of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. His wife, in the twice-turned gown, laying the table for the Christmas dinner, and assisting her is her daughter, Belinda, and the young man with the fork and the stuffing is Master Peter Cratchit. Hush. Listen, Scrooge. Set the table. It's almost time for Christmas dinner. Here's Martha, Mother. Martha! Why, bless your heart, Martha, my dear. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. Merry Christmas. How late you are, my dear. Oh, we had a great deal of work to finish up last night, and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind, so long as you're here now. Sit yourself down before the fire and have a warm. Lord bless you. Where's Father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is, and sometimes I think, Oh, dear God. If anything should happen to Tiny Tim... Mother, you shouldn't even think such a thing. Well, you're coming. There's Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. Merry Christmas, Father. Merry Christmas, Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. Oh, Tim, you darling. Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're glad to have you, Martha. How did Tiny Tim behave at church, Bob? Good as gold. Even better. I like church, Mother. They sang the nicest songs. I hope the people there saw me. Why is that, Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame, and I thought it might be pleasant at Christmas time for the people at church to remember who it was made the lame walk and the blind men see. Oh, bless you, my boy. What a wonderful oh, boy. What a sweet. Oh. Yes, children, we're all ready. Come take your places now. There's dressing and stuffing and plum pudding for all of you. Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim. Yes, Mother. You see that he eats plenty. He must grow tall and strong. Now sit down. Sit down, everyone. Ah, now, my dears, shall we say grace? Come. Tell me, Spirit, if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. Oh, no, 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 kind Spirit. Say, say that he'll be spared, that he shall live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. But what of it? If he should die, let him do it and decrease the surplus population. O oh, man of worldly mind, know what the surplus population is and where it is. It may be in the sight of heaven that you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Amen. And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast, Merry Christmas to us all. And may God bless us. Amen. God bless us, everyone. And now, I give you to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Ah, oh. the founder of the feast, indeed. Who pays you all of 15 shillings a week. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day... Well, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks to the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Bob. No one knows it better than you. My dear, Christmas Day. Hmm. I'll drink his health for your sake, and the day's, but not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and happy, no doubt. And I say God bless him too, Mother. And 
everyone. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their clothes were scanty, and had very likely known the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, and pleased with one another, and contented with the time. When at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, unto the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, to be startled by a hearty laugh. He was further surprised to realize it was his own nephew. Scrooge found himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side, approving of Fred's affability. He said Christmas was a humbug. He believed it too. More shame on him. He's a comical old fellow. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear? His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it, either for himself or anyone else. I have no patience with him. Oh, I have. I'm sorry for him. Who suffers by his ill whims other than himself? He takes it in his head to dislike us and won't come to dine with us. And what's the consequence? He loses a very fine dinner and good company. Just so, and he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. The whole scene. Passed off into the breath of the last words spoken by the nephew, and he and the spirit were once again upon their travels. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present, down among the miners, and with those who labor in the bowels of the earth, and out at sea among the sailors at their watch, dark, ghostly figures at their stations. Much they saw, and far they went. Many places they visited, but always with a happy end. In almshouse, hospital, and jail, where vain man, in his brief authority, had not made fast the door to bar the spirit out, the spirit left his blessing. It was a long night, if only a night. And it was strange too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew clearly older. A、uh, spirit's life so short. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight at midnight. For, forgive me, spirit, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your. Your skirt is it a foot or a claw? Look here. From the folds of his robe, it brought forth two children, wretched, frightful, hideous, and miserable. They knelt at his feet and clung to his garments. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, ragged, scowling, and wolfish. Where graceful youth. Should have filled their features out, they were stale and shriveled, as if aged and wasted. Are these are these children yours, spirit? They are man's. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both, but most of all the boy, for unless this can be changed and erased, on his brow I see written that which is doom. Have they no resources? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? But hark, my hour has come. No, 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 not yet, spirit. There, are, there are still more things I wish to learn. These you must learn from still another spirit.
Scrooge looked about him for the ghost. It had vanished. But lifting up his eyes, he beheld the third spirit, a solemn phantom, shrouded in black, draped and hooded, coming towards him, slowly and silently, like a mist upon the ground. Its entire form was concealed, save for one emaciated, outstretched hand. You are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are to show me the shadows of things that have not yet happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is this so, Spirit? <laughs> ghost of the future, I I fear you more than any specter I've seen. Yet, yet I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be a better man than I was, I. I am prepared to bear your company. Where, where are you taking me? We're here on a street among gentlemen of commerce. What spirit? What is there for me to learn here? I don't know much about it either way. All I know is he's dead. <clears throat> When did he die? Last night, I believe. What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. Well, I want to know what he's done with his money. Hmm, I haven't heard. Left it to his company, I suppose. Well, he hasn't left it to me. That's all <laughs> I know. Well, it's likely to be a cheap funeral, for I don't know anybody who would go to it. Well, suppose we make up a party and volunteer. Well,、um, I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> Help me, help me, spirit! Who, who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn him? No, no one to follow him to the grave? They were now in an obscure part of town, although never having been there before, Scrooge recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, and the shops and houses were wretched. Everything smelled of dirt, filth, crime, and misery. Spirit, why have we come to such an unclean and lowly place, and to a, a city pawnbroker's no less? The spirit's hand directed him into the wretched business. A disreputable, poorly dressed woman entered with a large bundle, almost tripping over another scruffy woman. And a somberly dressed man as she entered. They all seemed startled to encounter each other there. Let the charwoman alone to be first. Let the laundress be second, and let the undertaker's man be third. Oi! I was here first. As was I. All of you could not have come to a better place. You were his charwoman. Right, you are, old Joe. We have a right to take care of ourselves, and why not? He always did. True indeed, no man more so. You tell our undertaker's man. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man. No, indeed. What we want is a few shillings in our own pockets, and who's the wiser? If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, why wasn't he more natural in his lifetime? It's a judgment on him, right enough. A heavier haul it would have been if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open my bundle, old Joe, and let me know what the value of it. I should be first. It was no sin to help ourselves to whatever we could find. What about me? Wait your turn, woman. Wait your turn. Here, Joe, take a look.、Mm -hmm. Not much here. A pencil case, a seal or two, a pair of sleeve buttons, a brooch.、Hmm. Worth very little, this brooch. But you'll give me something for it. These two picked him clean before I had my chance. Look at these: some sheets and towels, a couple of old-fashioned teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs. Mine's much better. His bed curtains. You don't mean you took 'em down, rings and all, with him lying there? He isn't likely to take gold without 'em, I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were born to make a fortune. You were. Now. About his blankets, I I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? Don't be afraid of that. 
I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. And look at that shirt. His finest. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you mean, wasted it? Putting him in it to be buried in, to be sure. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off him. He can't look any uglier than he did. <laughs> <laughs> Scrooge recoiled in horror from this scene of scavengers. When he looked again, the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, upon which, beneath a ragged sheet, lay something covered up. A pale light fell upon the bed in the dark, silent, and lifeless room. Upon the bed, unwatched, unwept, and uncared for, was the body of a man. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it would have disclosed the face. But Scrooge had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the specter at his side. Scrooge could hear a cat tearing at the door, and there was the sound of gnawing rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in this room of death, and why they were so restless, Scrooge did not dare to think. Uh, this is a fearful place, spirit. L let us go. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoving finger to the head of the corpse. I, I understand you, spirit, and, and I would do it if I could, but I, I, I have not the power. Is there any person in this town who feels tenderness caused by this man's death? Show me, spirit, I, I beseech you. Spirit, why have you brought me here again to Bob Cratchit's house? But, but somehow it, it seems different now. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. The sewing hurts my eyes. Tiny Tim, he, he's gone? Oh, there. My eyes feel better now. I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home. It must be near his time. Much past it. But I think he walks a little slower these past few evenings. I've known him to walk with Tiny Tim on his shoulder quite fast indeed. So have I. Often. But Tiny Tim was very light to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble at all. Here's father now. Another day and a good warm fire to come home to. The day is always better for us when you're home. I happened to meet Mr. Scrooge's nephew, Fred. And he spoke to me very kindly. I'm heartily sorry about it, he said. I'm heartily sorry for your good wife. He's a fine man. He said he's going to try to find Peter a better situation. Hear that, Peter? I hope he can. Why are you so late, Bob? Because I went there today. How green a place it is. And so peaceful. My, my, my little child. My poor little boy. It's hard, the first parting among us. <laughs> How patient he always was. No complaining. No, none of us will ever forget Tiny Tim. I, I grieve with these people. Their child is truly mourned. Spirit, my, my heart is heavy. I, I know you will leave me soon. Please... Tell me the name of the man who was not mourned. Spirit, where are we now? A churchyard overrun by grass and, and weeds, and desolate with lonely, crumbling gravestones. Spirit, before I draw near to that gravestone and read the name upon it, answer me one question. Are these shadows of things that, that will be, or are they shadows of what may be? Will you not speak to me, spirit? Whose is that grave at which you point? 
I, I see it now. There's, there's writing on the stone. The, the name on, on the stone is Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, 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 spirit. Hear me. I am not the man I used to be. Why show me these things if I am past all hope? Tell me I can change these dreadful shadows you have shown me. I, I promise I will honor Christmas in my heart. I shall keep it all year round. I shall live in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out these lessons that they teach. Tell me, Spirit, tell me. Say that I can sponge away the writing on that stone, Spirit. I beg you, Spirit. I beg you. Spirit. I, I promise it. I, I promise it on my knees. I, I prom, I prom. Boy, what is this? What? Wait, it's it's my own room. It, and my curtains, they they're not torn down. My own bed, my own room. Oh, I oh, I must open the window. And the sun, oh, the sun is shining. It's it's clear. What a beautiful day. It's glorious, glorious. Hey, you there, boy. You mean me, sir? Yes, yes, my boy. What's today? What's that, sir? Yes, what day is it, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. What? Wonderful. I haven't missed it. Oh, oh the spirits, they've done it all in one night. Oh, they can do anything they like, I suppose. Oh, he- hello, my fine fellow. Yes, sir. Do you know where the poultry is on the next street? I should say I do. Oh, intelligent boy. <laughs> A remarkable boy. Oh, but tell me, do you know if they've sold the prize turkey hanging in the window? The one as big as me? Oh, yes. Oh, what a delightful boy. Yes, my young buck. It's hanging there now, sir. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yes, go there and buy it and I'll and tell them to bring it here and that I may give them directions on where to take it. Here, wait, wait just a minute. Here's half a crown for your service. Yes, yes, sir. And a Merry Christmas, sir. Oh, yes. And a Merry Christmas to you, my boy. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know what to do. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as light as a feather. And I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Oh, Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> and a Happy New Year to the whole world. Oh, aha. Oh, the bolter. Yes, my good man. Deliver that turkey to the Bob Cratchit family on, on Broad Street in Camden Town. And here's money for you. Here's money for the bird and a, and a cab to get you there and back. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best and went out into the streets, smiling and greeting everyone he met. He hadn't gone long before he met the gentleman who had been soliciting for charity the day before. My dear sir, yes, how do you do? I beg your pardon? Oh, yes, well, uh, yes, aren't you the gentleman who came to my office in regards to a charity? Why, yes, sir. Well, Merry Christmas to you, and, and I must ask your pardon, sir. I do wish to make a donation to your charity, uh, will you do me the honor to accept? And I, I prefer to whisper this. Lord, bless me, Mr. Scrooge. Are you serious? Yes, yes, if you please. And not a farthing less. <laughs> oh, a great many back payments are included in that sum, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? I will. I will indeed. <laughs> oh, I thank thee. I am much obliged to you. Bless you, and a Merry Christmas. The next morning, Scrooge was at the office early. He went early for a reason, to be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. He did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last he came. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too, and he was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. 
Uh, 15 and, and 20, uh, 15 and 21, 6, and carry the 1, 24, and carry the 2, 31, and 8, and 9. Cratchit! Uh, yes, sir! Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. What do you mean by coming in at this time of day? I, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. Yes, I, I think you are. But it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Let me tell you, Bob Cratchit, I will not stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, I must, I'm afraid, I must raise your salary. Sir? <laughs> yes, Bob. I'm going to raise your salary. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Bob. And a merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. <laughs> I shall raise your salary, and we shall see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the, and the rest of your fine family. <clears throat> and now, we'll discuss it this very afternoon. But first, make up the fire, Bob. <laughs> and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man, as the good old city knew, or any other city knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further encounters with spirits, and afterwards it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. And may that truly be said of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Every one. You've been listening to Willits Community Theatre and KLLG's production of A Christmas Carol. Our cast in alphabetical order was Mike Adair, Mary Burns, Elizabeth Dellett, Rod Granger, Kelly Kesey, Barbara Lee and David Lilker, Christopher Martin, Cindy Moore, Kevin H. C. Moore, Jeff and Finn Ship, Joe, Miranda, and Phaedra Swearingen. Today's show was adapted, directed, and engineered by Kevin H. C. Moore and produced by Mike Adair. WCT would like to thank its sponsors, Les Schwab Tire Center of Willits, and the NC Financial Group for financial support. And also thank Radio KLLG 97.9 FM for their continuing support of this radio play series. This show will be rebroadcast Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Saturdays at 8 p.m. for the month of December. If you wish to learn more about the Willits Community Theater, please go online to wctperformingartscenter.org Good evening, and thank you for lending us your ears. <laughs>